morning, San Antonio. It's Wednesday, a crisp 94 degrees outside, and traffic is terrible. You're listening to 1017 The Light. It's 6 a.m. I wake up, I take a shower, I get in the car at 8 a.m. Traffic is terrible. The entire drive, my mind is racing. How am I going to get everything done? At 11 a.m., I have the daily stand-up meeting that goes on for nearly an hour in which no one actually stands up. And right on cue, Jerry is rambling on about something. Do you all see that new commercial where the dog eats the ice cream? <laughs> so funny! There is no one more annoying than Jerry. At 2.30 p.m., I buy myself a Diet Coke to stay awake. At 5.45 p.m., I arrive home. My daughter greets me at the door. At 8 p.m., I take out the garbage. The light bulb by the trash can is burned out. Even though I know how to change a light bulb, I think to myself, I'll do that tomorrow. At 9 p.m., I decide to go to bed. At 11 p.m., I stop looking at my phone and actually go to sleep. Good morning, San Antonio! It's Thursday, a crisp 97 degrees outside, and traffic is terrible. You're listening to 1017 The Light. It's 6 a.m. I wake up, I take a shower, I get in the car at 8 a.m. Traffic is terrible, the entire drive to work, my mind is racing. How am I gonna get everything done? At 11 a.m., a daily stand-up meeting that goes on for nearly an hour, which no one actually stands up, and right on cue, Jerry is rambling on about something. Do you all see that new commercial where the guy falls off the skateboard? <laughs> so funny! There is no one more annoying than Jerry. At 2.30 p.m., I buy myself a Diet Coke to stay awake. At 5.45 p.m., I arrive home. My daughter greets me at the door. At 8 p.m., I take out the garbage. The light bulb in the trash can is burned out. Even though I know how to change a light bulb, I think to myself, I'll do that tomorrow. At 9 p.m., I decide to go to bed. At 11 p.m., I stop looking at my phone and actually go to sleep. Good morning, San Antonio! It's Friday! A crisp 97 degrees outside, and traffic is terrible! You're listening to 1017 The Light! It's 6 a.m. I wake up, I take a shower, I get in the car at 8 a.m. Traffic is terrible, the entire drug work, my mind is racing, how am I going to get everything done? At 11 a.m., the daily, daily stand-up meeting and goes on for nearly an hour, and no one actually stands up, and right on cue, Jerry's rambling on about something. Hey, do you all see that new commercial where it's raining hot dogs? <laughs> so funny! There is no one more annoying than Jerry! At 2.30 p.m., I buy myself a Diet Coke to stay awake. At 5.45 p.m., I arrive home, my daughter greets me at the door. Dad, 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 dad! Yes, darling? I need your help with my science project. Can you help me? I need you to run for 25 minutes every day for the next three weeks. <laughs> you want me to what? To run for 25 minutes every week for the next three weeks? I don't want to do that. But Dad, it's my homework. You have to do it. Why don't you ask your mother to help you? Randy, just help your daughter with her homework. Okay, okay. When do I start? Thanks, Dad. You start on Monday. Great. Good morning, San Antonio. It's Monday, a crisp 95 degrees outside, and traffic is terrible. You're listening to 1017 The Light. It's 6 a.m. I wake up. And I go for a run for 25 minutes. It is the worst 25 minutes of my life. When I get home, I take a shower. I get in the car at 8 a.m. Traffic is terrible. The entire drive to work, my mind is racing. How am I going to get anything done? At 11 a.m. at the daily stand-up meeting that goes on for nearly an hour, which no one actually stands up. And right on cue, Jerry is rambling on about something. Hey, do you all see that new commercial with the dancing ballerina and the teddy bear? And the... Oh, it's so funny. There is no one more annoying than Jerry. Although today he doesn't seem quite as annoying as usual. At 2.30 p.m., I buy myself a Diet Coke to stay awake. At 5.45 p.m., I arrive home. My daughter greets me at the door. At 8 p.m., I take out the garbage. The light bulb by the trash can is burnt out. Even though I know how to change a light bulb, I think to myself, I will definitely do that tomorrow. At 9 p.m., I decide to go to bed, and I am so tired that I fall straight asleep. Good morning, San Antonio. It's Tuesday, a crisp 96 degrees outside, and traffic is terrible. You're listening to 1017 The Light. It's 6 a.m. I wake up. And I go for a run for 25 minutes. It hurts a lot. I go home, I take a shower. I get in the car at 8 a.m. Traffic is terrible. The entire drive to work, my mind is racing about what I might want to do with my day. At 11 a.m., I have the daily stand-up meeting that goes on for nearly an hour in which no one actually stands up. And right on cue, Jerry is rambling on about something. Hey, do you all see that commercial with the talking banana? <laughs> 
so funny. Okay, that one actually was pretty funny. <laughs> At 2.30 p.m., I go to buy myself a Diet Coke, but I'm actually feeling pretty awake, so I just drink a glass of water instead. At 5.45 p.m., I arrive home. My daughter greets me at the door. At 8 p.m., I take out the garbage. The light bulb at the trash can is burnt out. Even though I know how to change a light bulb, I think to myself, I will do that tomorrow. At 9 p.m., I decide to go to bed, and I am so tired that I fall asleep. Good morning, San Antonio. It's Wednesday, a chilly 85 degrees outside, and traffic is terrible. You're listening to 1017 The Light. It's 6 a.m. I wake up, and I go for a run for 25 minutes. It's really not that bad. When I get home, I take a shower. I get in the car at 8 a.m. Traffic is terrible, but it gives me an opportunity to think about how I'd like to plan my day. At 11 a.m., I have the daily stand-up meeting, and I decide to tell Jerry about one of my favorite commercials. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. <laughs> hmm. At 2.30 p.m., I drink a glass of water. At 5.45 p.m., I arrive home. <laughs> my daughter greets me at the door. At 8 p.m., I take out the garbage. The light bulb by the trash can is burned out. So I go back inside, grab a new light bulb, go back outside, and Fix it. At 9 p.m., I decide to go to bed and fall asleep. The next morning, I wake up and I go for a run. And then again, the day after that. For the next three weeks, I go for a short run every morning. And one day at a time, I find myself being more productive, more positive, more focused, and more energized. My days were basically the same, but they felt different. I mean, my circumstances hadn't changed, but I had. <laughs> I had no idea that all this time I was one habit away from living a different life. <laughs> Who knew that habits have so much I want to tell you a little bit about what we know about why some habits matter more than others, and particularly how leaders can use this. And to tell you about it, I want to tell you the story of Paul O'Neill at Alcoa. Alcoa, as many of you probably know, is a large, the, among the largest aluminum companies on earth. And, and back when they hired Paul O'Neill as the CEO, he came in and everyone expected him to say he wanted to focus on productivity. He wanted to focus on making more aluminum and increasing mar profit margins. But instead, on this first day, he comes in and he talks to all the investors, all the employees, and he says his number one goal is worker safety. This causes everyone to kind of freak out. Worker safety, aluminum plants are these incredibly dangerous places. In fact, it wasn't uncommon for each plant to have at least one serious injury a year. Some of them were having one serious injury a month. Stock market went crazy. They said, dump all of your Alcoa stocks. They've hired this hippie who wants to talk about worker safety to be the CEO. But Paul O'Neill had this idea. His idea was that if he could convince everyone to change their worker safety habits, that it would set off a chain reaction that would change other patterns in the company as well. So he goes in and he tells everyone, listen, what's most important to me is that our workers come to work knowing that they are safe. The values of this company are productivity and profit margins and doing our job well, but the number one value is making sure that everyone knows that they can come to work and get home safely because we care about our people. It causes this transformation inside the firm. Because it turns out that the only way that you can do work safely is if, in fact, you're doing work well. So Paul O'Neill hires a bunch of consultants to come in and to find out how can we make aluminum in the most productive, the most by-the-book way so that nobody gets injured. 
Well, for years, the unions in Alcoa, they had been fighting this kind of efficiency training because it seemed like it was designed simply to line the pockets of the executives, not to improve workers' lives. In fact, there had been a strike just a few years earlier that had been encompassed in multiple states. But now Paul O'Neill comes in and he says, look, I want to do efficiency studies not because I just want to line my own pockets or increase profits, but because we believe in worker safety. We need to change worker safety habits. I want to get us to a place where we have zero injuries at all. And suddenly the union says, look, I can believe in that. That's something that I can get behind. And so they come in and they do efficiency studies. They figure out how to change habits throughout the entire company. The way that you make aluminum safely is that you make aluminum well. And then once habits changed around worker safety, they started changing around everything else. Because all of a sudden people started saying, well, look, if we can bring down our worker injury rate, which they did, then that probably means we can do other things as well. We can probably start making aluminum just in time. We can probably communicate better. And it turns out that, in fact, in order to communicate well, in order to to have a safe plant, you have to be able to know when an accident is happening as soon as it happens, which means you have to improve your communication with your workers, which means you have to build systems and habits that allow the floor workers to communicate to the executives as soon as something goes wrong so that they can step in and fix a problem before it actually hurts someone. When Paul O'Neill decided to start focusing on worker safety habits, he set off a chain reaction that changed communication habits, that changed efficiency habits, that changed cultural habits of how people interact with each other, where instead of fighting, management and unions were working together to accomplish a goal. These are known in the scientific literature as keystone habits. These habits that change how we think about ourselves and think about each other, and in doing so set off a chain reaction that changes our culture. And what we know is that keystone habits become powerful when leaders get behind them. Keystone habits are powerful when they involve values and emotions and talking about what we care about the most rather than just what we want to maximize. Keystone habits are the way that we change our lives and other people's lives. And as a leader, identifying the keystone habits in your organization, in your family, in your team, in your life, and saying, I want to optimize for that, will set off a chain reaction that makes everything flexible and everything better. In the life of every leader, there will be environments that are pressuring us to conform. There'll be opportunities that are tempting us to compromise. When we find ourselves in a difficult place, how do we decide to keep moving forward? This is a question that our next speaker has personally encountered throughout her career. Ibukan Awashika is the former chairman of First Bank of Nigeria Limited, the most valuable banking brand in Nigeria. She is also the founder and CEO of the Chair Center Group. In this session, Ibukan Awashika will tell us how to protect, foster, and strengthen our integrity and values when the pressure is high and the future uncertain. In 2020, Ibukan Awashika was given the Woman Africa Chairperson Award by Forbes magazine. She was also the first Nigerian recipient of the International Women Entrepreneurial Challenge. That's why the Global Leadership Summit is honored to welcome Ibukan Awashika. Thank you so much. Thank you for your very, very, very warm welcome. It's my second time at the summit. The first time I had the pleasure to be here a few years ago because I was privileged to be one of the grander vision stories that was shared in that year. And uh, I found it amazing. And so it's even a greater pleasure to be here on the other side of the stage and to share my thoughts with you. And I thank my brother, Samade Amu is here and is giving me support by being there and I can look at him and see him. And I do thank the team from GLS for the invitation. You know, as a people, we sometimes forget that we have the power of choice, that we have the remote control of our lives in our hands, that we are the ones who get to choose 
who we are, who, beco who we become, and what we do. That no matter what life throws at us at every minute in every situation, that only you ultimately makes the choice of what you do in that situation and you choose who you become because every choice you make every day has consequences and every choice adds up to become the totality of who you are. So we're going to be talking about the fact that only you can choose who you are in every situation. You're the one that chooses how far you want to go in life. Because you choose it by choosing to work, by choosing to be committed to getting the right education, by turning your adversities into good. Because like we heard earlier, our challenges don't need to drown us. We need to decide if we fight through to come up on top rather than be drowned by them. Only you can choose how far or how much you want to accomplish your life goals. Because even when life throws us curveballs, what do we do? Quickly give up or fight and fight and fight through until we get to where we want to get to. Only you can choose how you want to impact your society. If you pass by a hungry child and you have extra food and you choose to give it or not, that's the choice that you make about how you influence your society. If in your neighborhood you are an angel and an ambassador of peace and of unity, you make that choice and you make the difference because of the choice you make. Only you can decide what value system will guide your journey because you decide how you want to do things, what you want to consider to be important or not. I remember that as a young woman who started my first business in my 20s, based on how I had been brought up and just my sense of what is right and wrong, I made a choice to say that I wanted two things I was going to, that would guide my life in building my business. One, I was never going to sleep with a man to get a job. Two, I was never going to pay a bribe to get a job. In the environment where I come from, it sounded like the idealistic view of a young woman who wasn't going to go too far because there seemed to be things that would set me up not to do amazing things. But it's 33 years after, and by sticking to those values, and fighting through under different circumstances, I haven't done badly building a successful life. To thyself be true. To yourself be true. That's my version of a Shakespearean quote. We all look in the mirror every day. Who do you see? Who others want you to see or who you truly are? What is covering up your real view of you? And no matter what other people say to you, what do you know about yourself? What are those inner thoughts, those inspirations, those ambitions that you have that you're not able to express yourself because you're trying to conform to the world or to other people's view? What are those things that you need to come to terms with but you're not able or you do not have the courage or the conviction to fight for the truth of who you are. At the center of each one of us, there's a core. In the course of our lives, as a woman, you become a, a wife if you get married and you become a mother when you start having children. But those are sides that come out of your life. The center of who you are never changes because from when you were born, you went to school, you got educated, you had dreams, you had aspirations, you had ambition, you had things you wanted to do. And when you become a wife, that doesn't change. Your husband is added to you, but he doesn't take who you are. He shouldn't take who you are. It should be an enhancer of who you are and not someone that drains the energy of who you are. 
And therefore, the core of who you are should not be destroyed by the addition of the cap or the ball of being a wife. And it should be the same when you become a mother. Women in particular fall victims to this. So becoming a mother does not take away from the core. Your ambition, your drive, your vision, and all that you seek to be should not be replaced by your office as a wife or your office as a mother. It should be enhanced. Now, how do we work that out? That's for each one of us to work out. We work out our salvation according to the context of our own life and that which we seek to do. For men, it's the same. Your core, your vision, men manage it better than we do as women because it is socially permitted that the man is running with his vision, his ambition, and all of that. And that being a husband and a father should not take him away from that truth because he's the head of the household, and therefore he's permitted to go at that pace, and women tend to drop it. But we all have a responsibility in making the choice for our life to protect the substance of who we are because at the end of the day, except the core works, and the core is standing right. You cannot give what you do not have. If your vision and your ambition is buried in being the wife and the mother, or in being the father and the husband, you cannot be the best father or the best mother to your children. You cannot be the best man or the best woman because those other roles, you allow them to distract you and take you away from that. Now, what is key to us understanding how we're able uh, to make the right choices for ourselves? Let's start with a reflective exercise. And I'd like you to please write down the questions because you're not likely to give me the correct, uh, to give me the full answer in the course of this session. I want you to be able to go back home and answer the questions to yourself. I don't want to read your answers. Nobody needs to read your answers. It's your letter to yourself. It's you engaging with yourself. It's you answering your questions. But remember, to thyself be true. You don't need to ask anybody else to ever read it. But make it a note to you. Something you engage with that allows you to answer the right questions that would guide the decisions that you take going forward. My first question, where are you right now? And I'm not asking whether you're in the auditorium at Willow Creek. I'm asking, where are you in the journey of your life? Where are you in the context of where you would like to be? In the context of the entirety of your vision and your ambition for your life? Where are you right now? At what stage of your journey are you? Is it a place of satisfaction or dissatisfaction? Is it, are you where you want to be at age 50, at age 30, at age 70? Where are you right now? and answer that question honestly to yourself. Now, when you've answered that question, I want you to go to the second question. Who do you think you are? Not who your husband has told you over and over again that you are. Not who your boss has told you that you are. Not who your neighbor has told you that you are. Not who your mother told you all the years of your life that you are. What is your self-perception of you? What is your view of yourself? What, what, what are your inner understanding of the person that you are? What is your understanding of who you can be? Who do you think that you are? And then your next question. Where do you think that you're going? Where do you want to go to? Where do you think that you're going? Because you can't get to somewhere if you don't know where you're going. You're on a journey, you have a career, you have a job. Where is that job supposed to lead you to? Where, what is the destination of your career? What is the destination of what you do every day, what you're doing with yourself? Are you on the journey that will take you to where you really want to go to? Where do you think that you are? right now. Now, this is a bonus question because this question is not the life you have lived yet. And I put multiple ages because 
I don't know, maybe there are people that are 90 years old here, or 80 years old, or 70. But I want you to imagine that you're not at any of those ages yet, or you can add more, no matter where you think you are. And I want you to think about when you finish, when you're done with your life, how do you want to finish? Assuming you're reading the book of the life that you have lived, what would you like to read in it? What would you like your legacy to be like? What is the story of your life that you would like to be told? When you're done, how do you want your life to end? If today is your last day on earth and you had to read a book of the life that you had lived, what would you like to read in it? The beauty of this question is I'm challenging you about a life you haven't lived completely yet. Because if you have a picture of how you want to finish, if you have a picture of how the last day of your life, if you have a picture of what you want your legacy to be, you can go back and do a gaps analysis between where you are now and where you want to be. You can fill in the gaps and then decide to start mapping out how you want to live the rest of the days that, and it doesn't matter if you have five years more, if you have 10 years more, if you have 50 years more. It's about you living more deliberately and intentionally rather than living accidentally. Many of us live life anyhow. In my country, my people will say, they just live, Sha. Which means you just live a life. You just follow the crowd. You're just a part. You know when you go to a train station or you walk into the underground station like in New York and you have a crowd just moving and you're just part of it. Nobody can see you distinctively in that crowd because you are lost in the crowd because you're not standing out. You're just leaving and too many people are part of the crowd. It's amazing how many people have the title leadership who have nothing that they're leading by. They're leading people, they're follower leaders, as I call them. Leaders who are themselves followers and they're leading others to just follow. There's no distinctive agenda or vision driving their movement and they take others along with them. What is your vision? How do you want to end? How do you map out the journey from where you are now to how you can finish according to the plan? Yesterday might be gone, but it's never late. As long as there's today and there's a tomorrow, you have a chance to reset your life according to your own plan. You have a chance to make the choices that serve your own vision, that fit into your vision, that serve your purpose. You have a chance to reset. You have a chance to start. You can live many lives in one life by the choices that you make. But more than anything else, you can live the life that you want to live, not the life that you've just been given. Because you have the power of choice. Sometimes you pay a price to make that choice. You pay a price to restart the journey. You pay a price to reset the agenda for your life. But in doing that, you set yourself up to be able to finish and finish well according to your plan. Because the remote control is all yours. It's in your hands and you're controlling it. Now, what drives your choice? Your values, your goals, your ambition. Because every time you make a choice, there are consequences to your choices. Every time you decide to go left or right, there are sacrifices. There's opportunity costs for A or for B. If you don't have an agenda set, you cannot know why A is the best one for you and not B. Will it be just be about the money or will it be about values? Will it be about what is right or what is wrong? Or will it just be about what others tell you is right or is wrong? What is the guiding principle of the decisions? You know why this is important? 
There are many moments in our lives that we find ourselves at crossroads. When you get to a crossroad, what is your litmus test? What is that thing that is critical to you making the right decision at the crossroads of your life? What are those considerations? How do you determine that I do not go this way no matter what? How do you determine that I cannot betray my organization no matter what I am being offered? How do you determine that I cannot betray my vows to my wife no matter how beautiful the woman that is flaunting herself in front of me is? What is it that makes you determine that I cannot betray my organization and sell a company's secret to a competitor because I have certain values that guide my life and also when I finish the book of my life, I wanted to read, here lies a man of honor. Here lies a man of dignity. Here lies a man of character. Here lies a man who lived and you could take his word for it. Do you consider common good or just personal good? Because guess what? Common good always turns out to be personal good. What is good for your neighbor and your community will ultimately be good for you because it means that we have societies that will work better. And when our communities work better, they work for all of us. And we need to be bigger than self if we want to be true leaders. Visionary leadership requires that you see beyond the immediate, that you can see for the long term. That as a father in a house, the reason you do not consume all of your income is because you're planning ahead for your children. You're thinking about when they would go to college. You're thinking about having some reserve fund in case there's a family emergency. Oh, you can go drinking, you can go clubbing, you can do many things that some of your peers might do. But you can also plan for your family because you're right thinking and you're a responsible person. It's the same as you move into the corporate organization or into your community. How do you take the right decisions? What guides those decisions for you? Common good, personal good. And what is the backbone of the value system that drives it? Your faith? I'm a Christian. Maybe many of us are. But we're not all Christians. But I haven't seen one faith that makes you think of doing evil rather than good. I was raised a Muslim who then became a Christian. So I understand what it is to be on both sides. But I also understand that the commonality of good in the society is something that we can all relate to. And to put, to establish that, I've decided that we would look at Mahatma Gandhi's seven social sins. I don't know how many of us have encountered it before. The seven social sins by Mahatma Gandhi. And within those sins, he's talking about wealth without works. Do you want to make money without working? It means that you're going to steal. It means that you're going to be a corrupt leader. It means that you're likely to be one that will do the things that you shouldn't do just because for you, it doesn't matter how you do it, it's more important how you achieve what you want to achieve. If you destroy what is in common interest just so you can have what you want, then at the end of the day, you're a sorry sight. I was having a chat behind the scene before we came and I talked about a person who takes money that is meant for public health in a community and steals it to send his child to have the best education in some top school and to buy the best car. But then what happens? His son driving his best car has an accident in a location close to the area where he didn't build the hospital he was supposed to build. And there wasn't enough time to get him to the next hospital in the next town. And so the child dies because there's a lack of medical help, which he stole the money, and that was not provided. Jungle justice or justice of nature? Wealth without works. If you do all these um, 
Ponzi schemes and you're looking for quick and easy ways to make money. Or you sell drugs and you destroy the lives of many people's children. Or you do stuff that puts the lives of others at risk. That's you making money without really wanting to work. Pleasure without conscience. Oh, your, your friends, your best friend's wife is beautiful. And every time you look at her, you're lost after her. And she's game. So your game too. Pleasure without conscience. Ultimately, you pay a price. Knowledge without character. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If you're a man of no character, you wouldn't last long in a career path because you would soon be shown up. So I'm saying it doesn't matter how good you are at your job. Pay attention to do things right. Be a man of character. Be a man of civility. Be a man of dedication, a man of diligence. Be someone who can be trusted. Let your handshake be worthwhile in a transaction. Commerce without morality. Anything is good in business as long as you can make money off it. Is that really what we want? That we will make money at all costs? I remember there was a stage of my business life that the government of my country had a change of policy overnight. And 15 years of business was about to be shut down just based on the government policy overnight. I had a choice, either to choose an illegal route to continue in business. And it seemed I could reasonably explain it, that if God has established my feet upon that business and something went wrong, God will understand. But I also knew that God is not a wicked God and that if he established my feet upon that rock, he would not kick the rock from under me. So I had to find creative, innovative ways to continue without compromise. And that I did. And at the end of the day, based on my faith and my moral code on how I was brought up, I found new ways to rule in the space of my business and to do things differently. So commerce without morality is not something we want to do because ultimately somebody is paying the price and it's usually the society or other people. If you sell, I mean, look at all the opioid cases Somebody was making money off selling opioid, but many families were crying, even as companies were making money. We need to think about that. Bottom line is good for all our businesses, but bottom line at all costs can't be good for the world. And ultimately, it's bad for our business because it will come back to hunt us. Science without humanity. There are many things we can innovate and many things we're creating, but we must always ask the question, how does this serve humanity? How does it benefit humanity? Does it work against us or does it work for us? Because we control what we do with it. And we need to ask those questions. The bigger question is to build a better society for all of us. Religion without sacrifice. Our faith cannot be an excuse for us to do anything anyhow without consideration. Love your neighbor as yourself. It didn't say love your Christian neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. So with our religion, there must be sacrifice, and we must be able to behave in a way that we actually reach our neighbor, because our humanity above all else is important. Politics without principle, need I explain that? <laughs> because we all know what the politicians are around, around the world. They're not different from country to country. They're just in different shades of the same things. You know, and at the end of the day, if I'm on this side today, I'm on the other side tomorrow. If I'm willing to lie about something as basic as protecting the people from a pandemic just so I can get, uh, win an election, we have a problem. So we need to really wake up and ask ourselves, and we do this in our companies too, politics without principle. We play corporate politics without any consideration for tomorrow. It's a short-term game. It never lasts. It would always fall apart. And there's an eighth one, which uh, Gandhi's grandson added some years later. It's rights without responsibility. We're all so entitled in different ways, using different reasons, to feel that this is, I should be able to, this is my right, this is my right. But whenever our right impinges on the right of others, whenever our right conflicts with what is for the greater good of the society, then something is wrong. And we all need to think twice about the society that we're building. 
when we build a better world, it would come into our homes. When we build a better world, by simple principles that affect different parts of our lives, we will build better corporate organizations. We will build better communities where we live. We will build better countries that will work for all of us. But even more, because we cannot live in isolation in a world that is totally linked together, we will build a better world where we will all be sustained, be provided for. I have a simple principle that comes from my chemistry degree. Too much plus too little is equal to enough. Some nations have too much. Some people have too much. Some people have too little. Some nations have too little. But when we work together to make sure that the basics of all of us, individuals, communities, corporates, and nations are taken care of, we'll all have enough and we'll be happy in our own estate. Let's build a better world so you can have a better life. Thank you very much. I remember being told I was stupid, that I, this was all I could ever do, no one would ever love me, this is all I was good for. He dated me for six months, and then he invited me to move in with him. I thought that I had met the one. When we first got there, he told me to get dressed up, he was gonna take me out on the town, but instead he drove me to this dead end street, and he parked the car along the curb and he said, spent a lot of money to get you here, and you're gonna need to get that money back. And I thought, of course, you know, whatever I need to do to get a job, and he said, no, you're gonna go into that door right there, and it's an escort service, and you're gonna sign up. And when I started to say no, it's when he slapped me across the face. He said, you're gonna go in that room and you're gonna get my money back. When you're being trafficked, your trafficker definitely brainwashes you through a variety of ab abuse, um, sleep deprivation, food deprivation, threats to you and your family, threats to your children. You believe you're never getting out. If I just keep my head down and obey the rules, then someday I might be able to be okay. Over the next nearly six years, I ended up getting bought and sold between three different traffickers. I had been hospitalized for dehydration and overexhaustion. I've been to jail multiple times for solicitation related charges. I've been branded twice. Two men tattooed their names on my back. I've had my face broken in multiple places. I just wanted to die. And I tried to kill myself twice. It wasn't until a federal raid where my trafficker was finally arrested on tax evasion charges that I was finally able to grab my daughter and run. When I fled from my trafficker, I didn't think I would do anything with my life. I was sleeping on couches. I thought that I would work at a minimum wage job, live on food stamps as a single mom. I really had no clue what I was gonna do. Little by little, I started to rebuild. Little by little, I'd go to school, take a night class, get a promotion. Little by little, my daughter and I got the support and the community that came around us. Over this time of rebuilding my life, I met this guy named Matt, and we got married, we started a family. I had been about two to three years escaped from my trafficker really had started to find a sense of normalcy with me and my husband and our two little kids. When one morning, I was drinking my cup of coffee, and I can remember the Lord saying, how can you sit here and do nothing? How can you sit here in your nice, comfy house with your warm cup of coffee when you know what it's like to be more afraid to go home than you are to get in a car with a stranger? I started by turning my story into a training. I wanted there to be a narrative, a call to action, or like a solution to my testimony. And I started looking for different mentoring opportunities. 
That's when I got introduced to the Global Leadership Summit. I wanted to sop up as much leadership <laughs> as I could since we laugh, but it's, you know, serious. Like, your traffickers don't teach you how to team build. And so I remember coming back from that summit and writing a manifesto that I would be a boot camp for future leaders, that I would let people learn in my nonprofit how they wanted to go after their dreams. And that's really where it started. I just wanted to start sharing my story. I wanted people to know that trafficking was happening. We had this big conference and workshop where we're teaching some really nuanced like red flags for medical professionals. So this doctor attends the conference. The next day, he leaves the conference, goes back to his shift, and we got an email that said that very night, a young girl had come into the emergency room. He would have normally just dismissed her as a runaway that needed some maybe resources to get some drug help. But because of the training, he saw every single red flag that he had heard just the day before. And sure enough, this was a trafficked teenage girl that was sitting in ER for help. Because of this one training, that girl was able to get resources and into help that very same night. During that time of training all of these law enforcement and child welfare workers, we started to have survivors reach out and ask if we could mentor them on how to tell their story and how to make a difference in their communities. So with that, we started Elevate Academy, the largest online school for survivors in the world. We started with just five. Six years later, we have almost 900 students in 12 countries and spanning 400 US cities. My vision for the future would be able to continue to expand to make a real difference. I mean, sex for sale is out of control and it's gonna to continue to grow if we don't all start doing something. We have made so much progress in this fight against human trafficking, but there's still a lot of work to be done. If I wouldn't have pursued this, if I would have said no or been too scared, I think I would have missed out on my own healing. So not only did it help all the people we're serving and, and to feel like maybe we've made a difference in the nation, but it also helped me, it helped me to be a better mom, helped me to be a better wife, helped me to overcome all of the things that I, I came into this work with. And now I get to really make a difference and our team's making a difference and our allies and our partners, together we're making a difference. What a well-deserved applause, a powerful story. It's impossible to not be moved by Rebecca Bender's story, right? She took her mess, she turned it into her message. And that dream, it was born right here, right here at the Global Leadership Summit. And because of the summit's generosity, guess what? Through the development fund, her dream has become a reality. Elevate Academy has now become the largest online school for human trafficking survivors in the United States and 11 countries. And right now, some of those survivors from Elevate Academy, they're watching right now. We have 135 viewing the Global Leadership Summit. Let's give a round of applause for them. Those brave smiles and brave faces. Elevate Academy happened because of the Global Leadership Development Fund. And we want to give you an opportunity to turn someone else's dream into reality as well. A very generous donor has stepped up to the plate. Get this, if you give $100 or more, it will be matched up to a total of $1 million. We just want to say thank you to that donor for stepping up. The Development Fund, it also supports getting the summit translated into over 110 languages. So who's going to be the next Rebecca, right? Maybe Rebecca's story has inspired you to take one more step towards your dream. Or it's inspired you to help someone next to you take a step towards their dream. Or maybe it's given you the courage to share your own story. And we want to invite you to do that right now. You can email us your story at story at globalleadership.org. And for those of you who want to hear more about Rebecca's story, I know I do, um, Jason is going to be chatting with her on social tomorrow, so you can follow her and her story in that conversation on social. Make sure that you look for the hashtag, and you also look for the at GLN Summit, and you can hear more about Rebecca's really inspiring story. I have goosebumps from it. It is time now to thank our partners, and we want to thank our partners at Thrivent. We love that they believe that money is a tool, money is not a goal. 
They are driven by a higher purpose at their core. They are committed to providing financial advice, investments, insurance, banking, and generosity, and programs to help people make the most of all that they've been given. Thriving financial professionals, they focus on their client goals, priorities, guiding them towards financial choices that will help them live the life that they want today and the life that they want tomorrow. To learn more about their mission, services, or career opportunities, you can visit www.thrivent.com today. I hope you guys are enjoying the summit so far. We are almost through session three, but up next, a conversation you're not gonna wanna miss between Craig Rochelle and Jerry Lorenzo. What do you do when it feels like other leaders are more creative than you? How do we overcome feeling insecure about the ideas and projects that we've brought to the table? For many, creativity can seem like an elusive skill set. And yet, while some talents are God-given, there are many creative disciplines we can all embody. As a renowned fashion designer, Jerry Lorenzo has learned to embrace the pressure of being relevant and innovative year over year. Having founded the luxury streetwear label, Fear of God, Jerry Lorenzo is described by GQ magazine as reinventing luxury American fashion. As the CEO of a highly sought out brand, Jerry Lorenzo has developed a rhythm of staying inspired in his art and consistent in his values. In this interview with Craig Groeschel, you'll hear a creative leadership approach that is infused with honesty, adaptability, and a value on collaboration. The Global Leadership Summit is grateful to welcome Jerry Lorenzo. Jerry, it's great to have you, and it's a, a real honor to interview you for the Global Leadership Summit. Um, I have the deepest respect for you, sincerely, as a, as a leader, and was fun to meet you a few years ago after a conference and then follow you in, in different ways. And so I'd love to get inside of your mind and start with creativity. You're known often as a disruptor and um, really a brilliant creative leader. Could you talk to us a little bit about if, if a leader doesn't feel confident in their own creativity, what would you say to that leader to help him or her grow in, uh, in creativity? I think the word creativity has a, um, a preconceived kind of definition or meaning that sometimes is focused on super conceptual, artistic, and groundbreaking points of views. I can argue also, and I've said this many times, that I don't feel as if I'm creative. You know, I feel like I operate from a place of conviction and from a place of obedience. And just like you said, like I have in a conviction of my vision for the future. And that is what my kind of creativity is. And a lot of that creativity comes from problem solving and creating solutions and what I do in my world and through clothing and through fashion is, you know, how am I providing solutions for my customer's closet? And so it's not necessarily coming from a place of uh, how creative can I be to, to make an outfit super loud and extravagant. It's more so how can I provide solutions for what you need to, to wear day to day. Mm -hmm. And so starting at the problem sometimes is a great way to um, direct the creativity. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great way to look at it because most leaders are going to have strong convictions about something. And if they believe... Uh, passionately about solving this problem or attacking something else or creating a product, that conviction, you would say, drives the creativity and they become a problem solver in some form or fashion. Exactly. So when you're, when you're trying to create something and maybe you hit a wall and you can't find an answer to the problem or you can't seem to uh, crack the code, what do you do to attack that and uh, bring a fresh burst of energy or creativity? How do, you, how do you break through those creative barriers? I just fall back. I'm at a place now where I'm, I know that I'm not the best at what I do, but I know that what I have to offer is, is good enough. And so I know that um, the ideas are going to come. Sometimes I'm up against a timeline and I'm trying to nail a design or nail a perspective or nail a direction. If I feel it's not moving, um, Thankfully, I own, you know, my company, and if I need to push back a timeline, timeline, I can, and I kind of fall back from it, you know, but I'm also in a place where I'm constantly feeding myself, you know, I'm very conscious of what I'm watching on television, you know, I'm very conscious of what I'm listening to, and so even when I fall back, I'm conscious of making sure what I'm either listening to or watching or what I'm doing has the potential to feed me what that solution may be. Mm -hmm if that makes sense, even if it's not 
directly looking at, like through old magazines or references. It could just be, you know, I'm going to put an old 90s movie, up, movie on. You know, maybe there's going to be something that sparks a uh, design or the way something is styled, um, and I'm going to kind of tune out and, and, and veg out, but be open to potentially a solution that may come through. I think that's a great word is, is to step back and then even, to, it's almost like I, I call it when I'm trying to create a message, sometimes I hit a wall and I just turn the oven on low and let it simmer for a while. And then uh, sometimes if you get in a disconnected environment, you'll have ideas that'll spark along the way. So when I look at you from a little bit of a distance, your world is blowing up right now. You've got uh, new opportunities and you're gonna have your, your work cut out for you just to keep up with um, all the demand on your creativity and your organization is growing and expanding. What's interesting is I've heard you in the past in some ways kind of uh, quietly reject the traditional view of a CEO and yet you have an MBA and you're a brilliant business leader. Can you talk about how you let your values shape your leadership to be a little bit non-traditional yet still highly effective? I would love to say that what I learned in business school um, was foundational, it was more so being able to get through that process that taught me a lot of the skills and I guess or gave me a lot of the skills and confidence that I carry in what I'm doing. And so as the company grows and as it gets to a place that I feel in over my head, I can remember that I was once there before, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not something that I need to figure out right now. It's a, it's a day by day thing. And as long as I apply myself and I'm obedient to the call of my life, um, I just have confidence that those answers are going to come. Mm -hmm. You know, I made some really strong changes in my life like five years ago and I've been sober for five years and kind of rededicated my life to who I believe in, Christ, mm -hmm. and, and becoming integral within myself and kind of becoming the same person at all times and not being, you know, Jerry the designer, then Jerry the dad, and then Jerry out doing different things and being the same person consistently 100% of the time. I find that... I'm consistently open to solutions for what the purpose and plan is of my life. And I feel like that was the most important thing for me to do mm -hmm. was to get a clear vision of where I want the company to go, to get a clear vision of where I want to go as a dad and as a husband and as a father. And then I let those things kind of direct the decisions. I let those things kind of direct the choices that need to be made. And um, I believe that in the vision that's been kind of like placed in my heart, because I feel it was placed in my heart, I also feel that, you know, I'm not the only one that carries the responsibility of that vision coming to life. And so I put a lot, a lot of that responsibility on him. I'm just like, all right, man, you got to give me what's next because I'm like, I'm at the end of myself right here. Yeah. And so um, I can, I find peace in that. I think it's fascinating that five years ago, you made some major changes in your life. And I love the humility of which you talk about it. You broke free of some stuff that really was holding you hostage and made some changes. And it's about the time really when your career and your influence took off. Um, I wonder if you could speak to a leader right now that may be in a place in their personal life where it's not quite where they know it should be. And that could be something that's holding back the rest of their life. What advice would you give to someone to say, if you fix what people don't see, that might actually fix you know, what everyone does see. What advice would you have for someone who's stuck or hurting right now personally? Um, I think it's easy to get caught, you know, in the prisons of uh, other people's perceptions of who you are, you know, and, and a lot of times if you're still living in a way that feeds into those negative perceptions, it can prevent you from, you know, running after the destiny that you're really convicted of that's for you. And I think... Um, one of the things T.D. Jake said, I did this post the other day, was just like the quickest way to um, leave your history is to run after your destiny. Mm -hmm. And so in order to run after your destiny, kind of what you said is, you know, what are the things that, what's, what's the inventory I need to take of my personal life? You know, where do I need to get personally so that I can be open to kind of where I need to go? And then once you have that vision again of where you need to go, I feel like a lot of things kind of fall into place and becomes just more clear. And it's easier to make decisions because you, you know where you're going and you're focused on your destiny. You're no longer focused on the opinions of others. You're no longer focused on the shame of your past or the shame of your present of what things you may still be struggling with. I think that's why vision is so important because vision provides the roadmap um, 
for where you want to go and being able to have a vision, like you said, for your own life. Mm -hmm. And then from that, having a vision for whatever it is God has given you in your heart that you're building. Mm -hmm. Well, you've lived that. When, you're, when your vision's strong enough, you'll pay the price um, and endure the cost of whatever it takes to get there. And you've obviously done that both personally and professionally. And I celebrate your professional success, but even more so your personal success of who you are as a husband and a, and a dad. And um, behind the scenes, it's, it's really special. You're incredibly disciplined. What would you say to a leader who says, I just really struggle to choose the right disciplines? You're going to struggle to lead. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to struggle to lead. What was the quote that you said about discipline the other day that we mentioned off camera the Discipline earlier? is choosing what you want most over what you want now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I would give them that, Craig. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> I, would, I would steal that from you, and then I would give that back in this interview. So here's a personal question. Do you ever feel insecure and not good enough? Yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, you know, I, th I think... You know, as this thing grows and becomes what I've been convicted that it would become, and now that it's here, and now it's this uh, this other feeling that you have of insignificance, and like, am I fooling the world? Am I, you know, not as 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 um as good as what I'm promoting myself to be? And I think those are just human feelings that we all have. I think we, you know, the, the way that I get through that is I, you know, I, I put those pressures on on the one that made me and take them off my own back and just say, hey, I'm gonna be obedient to the call and I'm gonna be the mirror to the light. I'm gonna be the echo to the voice. Mm -hmm. And you know, when things get to be too heavy, that's just kind of how I shift my focus and allows me to get through that little rut. And I think we all go through that. And I think having a relationship with a, you know, with a higher power and knowing that your, your best ideas um, come from outside of you mm -hmm. um, and being able to plug into that um, really relieves you from a lot of self-stress that we put on ourselves. I'm sure we've got a lot of people that are watching that are in sales and they feel the pressure that you're only as good as what you produced last month. For me, it's you're only as good as your last talk and there's a lot of fear like, can I do it again? You probably have times like that where you feel like you're only as good as your last design. You're only as good as your last product. How do you push through that fear of um, not being able to top what you did last or continue to be successful moving forward? You know, I, I'd like to, to, to think that what we've been doing has, has always been honest and always been rooted in problem solving. And so, you know, when I get to in these creative places where I don't feel like I have the idea or I'm scared of this next collection, it's just, it makes it easier when I go to the problem. You know, I think this last collection, our seventh collection, you know, my problem was, you know, at 43 years old, I felt like I, I looked like I was 25, you know? And so how do I maturate my I don't my style? have that problem. I'm not sure why. <laughs> <laughs> I think you dress suitably and appropriately for your age. And I think I was at a problem where I just was not doing that. Uh -huh. And so I would want to go to a, you know, parent teachers meeting. And I felt like the teachers are going to look at me like a kid. And so how do I walk in and um, be appropriate and be sophisticated, elegant, um, but still be myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to lose that either. And that's a problem. And so that's how we kind of designed into uh, our latest collection was how do we solve this problem of this customer that we're serving that's maturating and is maturing and has um, uh, new activities in his life and, and what are those new solutions that we need to provide. And so I guess when you get to those ruts, it's like, what is the new problem? Mm -hmm. That, I guess, gives you the creative answer to now Good. direct the vision. Well, to be a great leader, you're going to have to collaborate, and you're, um, you're brilliant at collaborating. You had great partnerships with Nike and now Adidas, or internationally we'd say Adidas. Adidas, yeah. Um, what goes into your mind? How do you work well with different teams of people who are often very different from you, and maybe you could help some other leaders grow in their ability to collaborate with other leaders? One of the great things about Adidas is, you know, uh, we see the future the same way. And so that's what is the, the thread that keeps us together. And so that's a relationship that I'm excited about because we're not constantly um, internally competing, but we're pushing each other for, for what we feel like the future needs to look like. And so I think when you are in establishing or creating these other relationships, I think, you know, do you see the future the same way is kind of like the biggest mm -hmm. question. And I think I got my wife this anniversary card and it said, you know, relationships aren't built on how you 
gaze at each other, but how you look in the future in the same direction. Mm. Looking at these like different relationships or collaborations uh, prior, to, prior to entering into those relationships, that should be the first question I think that's asked. We've obviously done a good job of choosing some great partnerships. I would imagine that there's times when you're sitting um, in a brainstorming session and you're working with some people and there's a disagreement and yeah. you're pretty sure you're right and they're pretty sure they're right. How do you know when to bend and be flexible or when do you dig in and say, this is the way it's gotta be? Oh man, that's tough. That's tough because so much of what, uh, again, I do is, is, is instinct and conviction and sometimes it's hard to sell or to push beyond that. I think there's a level of humility that has to kind of enter the room you know, and if you are that convicted and you feel as if what you're pushing may be pushing who you're trying to serve away, it's the constant reminder like, hey, this is what I feel like is going to best serve what we're doing together. This has nothing to do with what I just selfishly feel like is best, but this is me trying to serve you in the best way that I know how. And that has kind of been the way that I've been able to navigate those tough situations and if it's necessary to take a break and fall back and say hey maybe let's reapproach this tomorrow i i could be wrong mm -hmm. you know let me take some time to to think about this and come back and take in the information that you've given me but understand whatever it is that i'm bringing to the table i'm just trying to serve this problem that we're we've agreed that we're both trying to solve mm -hmm. and i think if when you can position it in that way you know it takes the um the pressure off of, 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 of feeling heavy handed, you know, and like uh, selfish in your point of view and more so like, hey, this is, I'm just trying to serve us together. As you're growing and expanding, you're adding team members and, and hiring to keep up with the demand. Besides competency, someone that's good at what they do, um, what are some of the top qualities you look for when you're bringing someone onto your team? Do they believe in what I'm doing? You know, obviously competency is like, you know, super important, but, you know, I'd, I'd much rather prefer someone that's dedicated to, you know, what the vision is here and believes in the vision. I think that to me is the, the biggest key in building any team, whether it's sports, whether it's fashion, whether it's a uh, church or, or, or whatever it is that, you know, that team that's being built is like, do we share the same vision for the future? And is this something you believe in? Mm -hmm. I think if it's something you believe in, it'll take you beyond what you're competent and it'll bring out gifts and talents in someone that maybe you didn't see in the beginning because they're putting everything they have into something that they want to see only the best for. Um, and sometimes when you make hires just kind of based on expertise, um, the conversation is, is, is um, boxed in the expertise of the conversation versus the bigger picture. And I'm always a bigger picture guy. Yeah. Like how do we get to, you know, how do we get to the uh, to the end zone, not just a first down? Uh, as your organization's grown, I'm sure your understanding of leadership has grown. Is there something that you've learned in recent years that you would go back and tell a younger Jerry years ago, hey, if you know this, this could be helpful to you? If I knew what I had to do to be here, I'm, I'm, I would maybe tell a younger Jerry, hey, maybe do something else. <laughs> this, yep. is gonna, this is gonna push you to, um, to the end of yourself consistently. You know, it's just like grad school. It's like you, you think you're not ready for it, but each course prepares you for the next year. Each year prepares you for the next year and the learnings and the losses and the wins prepare you. And so maybe that's what I would tell them is just like, you know, don't look at down the road. You know, obviously have a vision of where you're going, mm -hmm. but you're not carrying that weight right now, right? Right now you're just carrying the weight of getting from today to next week, mm -hmm. you know, and to, to focus on the things that are in front of you, but not losing sight of, of the bigger picture and letting that drive you. Well, it's great advice. And um, to quote Jesus, <laughs> when, you're, uh, when you're faithful with a little, he trusts you with much. And he's trusting you with much because you've been faithful with a little on the way. And I celebrate his blessings in your life and your influence. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. man. Oh, the COVID, the COVID bot. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I always love personally hearing from Craig and Jerry, and of course, Ibakun before that. Uh, what an incredible, incredible session that that was. So many great insights that were dropped, uh, just firebombs of insight. As a matter of fact, a lot of you were sharing your chat, uh, your takeaways in the chat. I want to highlight a couple of those. Here's Diane's takeaway from Ibakun's talk. Even the accidents in life can grow you. Such great insight there. Tammy said, I want to live a life that makes a difference in the less fortunate. And then Olapeju says, never too late to reset the agenda of your life. I know if you're anything like me, sometimes we feel like it's too late to make a step, but it's never too late as we heard from earlier. Also from Jerry's interview, Pat said, vision provides the roadmap for where you want to go. And then just a second ago from Jerry's interview, Mike says, when you get into creative ruts, Return to the problem. Get back to the core of it because that's where you started. Such, such great insight. I'm sure you all want to continue to learn from all of our incredible faculty. There's ways that you can do that. If you're anything like me, though, you probably need a little bit of a break. We all need to stretch our legs here and there. We're going to do that in just a second. But while you're on that break, I want to give you just a few things to be aware of and make sure that you know about on our GLS online experience. Uh, if you have not clicked into that yet, you can go to your email to make sure you get access to that. Click on the GLS online link to make sure that you can get the full experience there. Uh, and several things that you can do through there. Obviously, uh, we have everything that's going on live right now, but we want this to be something that is not only happening here and today and tomorrow, we want you to be able to carry this beyond just what you hear. So, so that you can go back and rewatch and re-listen to all the insights that are being shared by all of our incredible faculty, this is going to be on demand available to you for the next seven days in your GLS online experience. So make sure you take advantage of that. Also, if you click at the top, there's a button there that says shop. All of our faculty have books and resources available so you can continue to learn and gain great insight from them. And I also want to point you to the Summit Guide. Those of you who maybe are just joining us or maybe you've been with us all day but you have a few questions, you can go to the Summit Guide. That'll give you all of the information that you need for anything dealing with the summit. You've got our digital notebook there that has all the information for all of our faculty as well. I also want to point you to the exhibit hall where you make sure you can go in there. You can see all of our sponsors. You can see all of our partners uh, like Thrivent and uh, all of the different uh, people who have allowed us to make this possible today. So make sure you check that out. And then here's a special, special thing I want to make sure you know about too. You're here in GLS 21. We're back. We're having an incredible time. But GLS 22 is coming. We're already thinking ahead. And I know that you're thinking right now, I'm getting all this great information. I'm learning how I can lead in my space and continue to grow in my influence with those who are around me. But we want this to continue to be something that not only happens now, but throughout the year and into next year. So if you register today for GLS 2022, you will also get GLS Special Edition, which will be in the winter in just a few months, for free. So I want to encourage you to go ahead and do that. Register today. Actually, registration is going to open in just a little over two hours from now at 5 o'clock Central. So please, please make sure you take advantage of that. We want to make sure that we continue to grow because when the leader gets better, everyone around us gets better as well. So I'm going to send you to that break here right now in just a second. Coming up. Don't stay away too long because at 3.15 Central, we're going to start back for our last session of the day, session four. We've got Rich Wilkerson Jr. coming up. We've got Liz Wiseman coming up. And then a favorite here at the summit, Dr. Henry Cloud. You do not want to miss it. So make sure, that's right, make sure you watch your countdown clock and we'll see you back here at 3.15 Central.